Both of my parents were teachers, and I think of myself as an educator at heart, even in real estate. You know, my dad's favorite quote growing up has always stuck with me. He says, you can have everything in life that you want if you're just willing to help other people get what they want. I love that quote because it really does embody what we stand for at the Forbes Group. We're simply a real estate company that's here to serve you. I'm Ryan with the Forbes Group at Keller Williams Realty. We're proud to be the sponsor of this episode of Urban Explorers TV and the visionary behind the Atlanta Beltline, Ryan Gravel. Good morning, I'm Steve Sines with Urban Explorers TV. I'm here today with Ryan Gravel, whose master's thesis at Georgia Tech in 1999 was the inspiration for the Atlanta Beltline. Welcome, Ryan, thanks great. for joining us. Great to be here, thanks for having me. Great. So I guess my first question is just, how do you come up with the idea for the Atlanta Beltline? Uh, well, it evolved over time, I think. I, was, uh, I did a year abroad in Paris in college when I was studying architecture at Georgia Tech in the early 90s. And really changed the way that I saw the world. Um, I had lost 15 pounds in my first month of being there because I was eating fresh food from the local market and walking wherever I went. And the relationship between the built environment and the way that we live and our lifestyle became really clear to me. And I was interested when I came back to Atlanta and how to make Atlanta the kind of place that uh, had the similar kind of um, interesting relationship. So um, I continued uh, studying architecture and, and urban planning through graduate school, became obsessed with the role of infrastructure in, in our lives. And uh, when I needed a thesis, uh, it had to be a sort of um, a design project, but at a city scale to accomplish both architecture and planning. And so I had this idea for this loop of old railroads circling the city. And is Atlanta unique in that it has that loop? I'm guessing it is because it, it was started as a railroad town. Sure, yeah, Atlanta's built by railroads. That's the reason that we exist. So there are railroads everywhere. A beltline is a, is a term, historic term for kind of beltline that belts around the city, not the one that goes through the middle. Right. And a lot of cities have beltlines, but Atlanta's unique to have four that line up to roughly form a loop. So the idea was to reuse the railroad itself for transit, um, to uh, incentivize the development of all that abandoned land, and to revitalize uh, the neighborhoods along the way, many of the t many of which at the time had really been struggling against sort of the onslaught of the 20th century and you know decline. But now we're sort of perfectly positioned to come back to life. So the Beltline was a way to um, re-energize, revitalize those communities. So talk a little bit about how you took the idea, what was in the thesis, and and made it a reality. What were the key drivers that made that happen? Well, you know, I'd never imagined we would actually do it. You know, it was just an idea for school, and I put that book on the shelf and went to work for an architecture firm. Um, ended up doing a lot of mixed-use redevelopment type projects. Um, a lot of them happened to be on the Beltline Corridor because there was growth pressure there at that time. Developers could come in and buy a big tract of land, pretty easily rezone it for medium density kind of development. And we were working on one site that would become Inman Park Village, and we were trying to decide, do you take the parking garage and jam it up against the abandoned railroad, or do you orient the project toward the railroad, hoping it would become something better one day? And um, I was telling my coworkers about this idea I had in school, and they thought it was cool. And so we um, talked to some people about it, and the more people we talked about it, the more people wanted to hear more about it. And so we put out, eventually put out some letter, a letter and with some maps, mailed it out to everybody we could think of, the governor, the mayor, all the regional planning agencies. Got a great response from Kathy Willard. She was on city council, chair of the city's transportation committee. She was frustrated with the lack of investment in transit in the urban core of Atlanta. Um, and this letter landed on her desk and she thought, wow, this is cool. So we, she called us in, we met with her. Um, this is the summer of 2001, so a few years after I graduated. Um, and she called us and we went, she had, she had a town hall meeting in a church basement in, in Virginia Highland. And the neighborhood fell in love with the idea. And we, she had a couple more and we built some momentum. And then she was elected that fall, the city council president. So we took the conversation citywide. And literally for two and a half years, we went to every neighborhood group, neighborhood planning unit, um, church, school, 
business, Rotary Club, anybody who wanted to hear about it, we went to talk to them. Um, I was doing three and four meetings a week, and so was she, and so was her staff, and a handful of volunteers for two and a half years. <laughs> and it was, we created this incredible groundswell of public support for the project that then got the attention of other elected officials, the regional planners, and, and, it, the, and, and she, at the same time, was able to get it in a transit study through MARTA, and uh, which started th looking at the viability for transit. Hey, this isn't just some cute little trolley. It actually would carry tens of thousands of people every day, connecting them into MARTA and the larger transit network to get downtown or midtown or airport or wherever. And uh, simultaneously looked at it through Invest Atlanta, which is the city's economic development agency, um, who saw the economic potential that this would bring, not only accommodating growth in the north and east part of town, but also spurring new investment in the south and the west where there hasn't been any new investment for 30 or 40 years. Um, so all these things started to pile together and we started creating this amazing momentum. Um, by 2004, uh, this, the Trust for Public Land came in and said, well, you know, what about 1,400 acres of new parks in addition to this great concept that are connected? So the idea really started to expand and grow and with every new constituency, the grassroots movement got bigger and it really compelled and even obligated the le city leadership to build it. What about unintended consequences? Are there any, any things that, that have happened that maybe you didn't anticipate? I didn't anticipate people loving it so much. <laughs> I that's know a that's, that might not be the kind of thing you're answering, but you know, the, the expansion of the vision beyond what the, I just described what it was. I mean, in the very early days, it also became a greenway trail and, and we didn't see that really coming. Um, it, was, it was part of the original pitch to Kathy and the community, but um, that, and it was part of that movement. But beyond that, to add all the new parks and the affordable housing and the art and all the things, you know, there's talk about bocce ball courts and a food forest, and you know, people continue to sort of layer on these ideas of their own. The, the public's ownership of it has been really surprising and really exciting to see happen. Um, you know, we knew that it was gonna change communities for the better. And, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but a lot of the challenges and the downside is making sure that the people who live there get to be a part of that change. Exactly. And so I think that that is definitely one of the challenges uh, looking ahead. Depending on who you talk to, Atlanta has, you know, a good reputation or maybe not such a good reputation mm -hmm. around the world. Has the Atlanta Beltline actually done anything to sort of move the dial on either the perception or the reputation of Atlanta in your mind? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I say this all the time that the Beltline is not only changing the physical form of our city, it's changing the way that people think about the city, both regionally and internationally. You know, locally, I live you know, right here and we have people park on our street to go to the Beltline, unload their strollers and their dogs for the day and they spend the day out here and they're from Cherokee and Gwinnett and you know Coweta County and they are coming in they're changing their perspective of what happens in the city and what this lifestyle is all about and they're sort of changing their perception of the city they're also going home and thinking about what they can do in their communities to make them better I was in Singapore back in March and they have a, a 15 mile railroad across their island country and they've been following the Beltline for five years. They see it as their model for what they want to do in their community, which is pretty cool. That's, that's excellent and you should be proud of that. I mean, yeah. you, that's an un unintended consequence really yeah, when you think right. about it, yeah. right? The fact that you, I wouldn't say single-handedly, but you played a, a, a big part in, in, in changing the perception of, of the city of Atlanta around the world. That's, that's well, you know, it's, it's for me too. I mean, it surprised me the way it's happened. You know, we moved to Crog Street two years ago We've always lived on the Beltline, but on the east side now. And our kids, you know, their worldview is being shaped by this thing. And, you know, the, and, and when you see them and their assumptions about Atlanta being the kind of place that you can ride your bike to the grocery store, yes. that, that play, that's really different for a lot of us who have been around for a while. No question. And it's important looking ahead as, you know, the challenges that are coming, whether we are going to be able to, to tackle those things. It makes it seem more possible. You mentioned uh, regentrification uh, briefly a minute ago. A lot of people are now talking about that, or, or at least questioning whether all this regentrification is really a good thing. Mm -hmm. Any anyone comments about that in terms of whether that's been uh, did it go according to plan, or is it causing some problems, as you suggested a while ago? Well, you know, and, and the, the answer to the question of gentrification cannot be to not provide people with transit, access to jobs, um, parks, greenways, trails, grocery stores. That can't be the answer. 
you know, any improvement that you make to a community in a growing economy is going to make it more desirable and it will bring other people in and will rise the values and the rents, you know, no matter if that's a Beltline or just a creek cleanup or a tire, you know, um, there's all kinds of, you know, the, the, the challenge is financial, it's rising rents and taxes. And so we need tools as part of this discussion to also solve those problems, those challenges for people. Um, what the Beltline has done is it has brought some of those tools to the table mm -hmm. and it has ex elevated the conversation around the, those topics in a way that nothing else really has. Um, and because that grassroots movement that made the Beltline come to life was included the broad diversity of Atlanta neighborhoods. Everybody loved the project. For people who are on the lower income of that economic spectrum, they loved it too. They just want to be around when it, when it shows up. And, and we need to make sure that that they are, and so uh, w their participation in the project um, was the was why we have 15% um, in the tax allocation district that goes to affordable housing. Um, it's why we've created the community land trust collaborative. It's why we put together some other tools. It's not enough, and the 5,600 units or 5,200 units that the city is obligated to build as part of that um, is an important first step, but mm -hmm. it's a drop in the bucket compared to the need. So I think. Looking ahead, it's important that we um, use the Beltline as a vehicle for driving this conversation that really otherwise I'm not sure would be happening at all. And kind of wrapping up this segment about the Beltline here, um, what keeps you up at night about the Beltline? I think that question, you know, uh, the question of um, is, are we going to build it for everybody? Because mm. at the end of the day, it can be a great economic success for the city as a whole, but if it's not a success for the people who made it happen, then I don't think that we can call it um, it, it's not the success that we all had hoped for, you know. This, because of, because the project came out of this grassroots movement, because it was a movement of neighbors and neighborhoods, um, you know, we were making promises to our friends and our neighbors that this project was going to be different. And it is different, but it, but we have a long way to go before it's implemented. Sure. And so we have to make sure that that's, um, that we stay true to that vision. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Urban Explorers TV. I'm Ryan with the Forbes Group at Keller Williams Realty.